Okay, so this chapter is going to focus on sampling distributions and what we can do with those and how those look and how we analyze them and how we can use them. Okay, so we need to get into some vocabulary first. The first thing being statistical inference. So statistical inference is just going to be the information from the sample that we use to draw a conclusion about the larger population. So basically, we're taking the sample and we're trying to apply that to the entire population. Um, and we can use that to determine things like, for example, if the sample has a similar mean to the population. Um, we can also use this if x is a random variable. Okay? So we need to know how close they are to the, having the same mean, and we need to know that x is a random variable. And your vocabulary during this time now, really from this point on, your vocabulary and the notation that you use is going to be very important. For example, this means mean and this means mean, but they are mean of two different things, right? This is the mean of the population and this is the mean of the sample. And if you are talking about the sample and you use the mu for the population or you're talking about the population and you use the x with the bar over it, um, you'll get dinged a little bit in your free response stuff. Okay, so also we need to talk about the difference here between a parameter versus a statistic. So both of these are numbers. So a parameter is going to be a number that describes some particular characteristic of the population. Okay, P for parameter and population. So some number that's describing some particular characteristic of a population. Maybe it's the proportion of a population that does a certain thing or likes a certain thing or the mean of the population or the median of the population. Where a statistic is going to, again, be a number, but a statistic is a number that's describing a characteristic of the particular sample. For instance, let's say we're talking about um, surveying U.S. households. Okay? The parameter would be the mean. So the parameter we would use, let's say we're talking income. So the parameter would be the mean income of every household in the U.S., Okay, where the statistic would be the mean income of a sample. Let's say we did a sample of 60,000 households. That would be the statistic. And then I could use this statistic from those 60,000 households to help estimate our unknown parameter, which would be, again, the mean income of all of the households. Okay, so let's walk through this particular example here. So for both of these examples here, we are looking to identify the population, parameter, sample, and the statistic for each one of these. So looking at the first one, it says the Gallup poll asked a random sample of 515 adults whether or not they believe in ghosts. Of the respondents, 160 said yes. Okay, so our sample for this one is going to be the 515 adults. Okay, and our, remember our statistic is going to come from the sample. So our statistic is the proportion of adults that believe in ghosts, which is equal to our p hat. Remember we had our y hat? Okay, so that's our p hat. So that would be 160 over 515. That would be my statistic. That would be my sample of people that believe in ghosts. So my parameters and my population for this, okay, so my population then would be all U.S. adults because that's what we're trying to apply that statistic to, um, but I can't do it anywhere else. I can only do U.S. because that's where my sample came from, right? So all U.S. adults and my parameter now, well, I can't spell. Okay, so my parameter for this is going to be the true proportion, so P, the true proportion of adults that believe in ghosts. So the adults that believe in ghosts over US adult, all U.S. adults. So number two is talking about during the winter months, temperatures outside the Starnes' cabin in Colorado can stay well below freezing for weeks at a time. To prevent the pipes from freezing, Mrs. Starnes sets the thermometer at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. She wants to know how low the temperature actually gets in the cabin. A digital thermometer records the indoor temperature at 20 randomly chosen times uh, during a given day. The minimum reading is 
38 degrees. So again, our sample here is going to be the 20 times it recorded temperature, right? So the 20 different temperatures that were recorded throughout that day, okay? And so if that's my sample, then my population is going to be the temperatures for all times of the day. Every second of the day, what is the temperature? So that's going to be our whole population. Again, our statistic is going to come from our sample. So our statistic in this case, sorry, I've been doing that in red. Our statistic in this case is going to be that minimum reading of 38 degrees Fahrenheit and our parameter that we're trying to apply to our whole population is going to be whatever, so our parameter is going to be whatever the true minimum is for that particular day. So as we find these samples, one of the things that we're going to need to realize is that the value of our statistic is going to vary if we did repeated random sampling. If we went back and we took a different sample of 515 different adults, it may not be exactly 160 of them believe in ghosts. If we went back and took 20 samples of temperatures from different times of day from the star in this cabin, then the minimum may not be 38 degrees. So when we do repeated random sampling, we can get this statistic, um, the value of our statistic may vary just a little bit. And that's our sampling variability, is I'm taking the same statistic, I'm taking multiple random samples from the same population, and I'm looking at the variability between the statistic from all those different samples. And so the way we're going to be able to examine this and kind of pick this part is, first of all, we're going to need to take a large number of samples from the same population. Okay, so again, they have to be from that same population. And then we're going to calculate the statistic for every single one of those samples. So the number of people that believe in ghosts, the minimum temperature, the mean household in income. Okay, so we calculate the same statistic for each one of those samples, and then we're going to make a graph of that statistic. Okay, of whatever we found of, you know, a graph of all the different values of proportions of people that believe in ghosts from 60 different samples, okay? And then we're going to take that graph and we're going to cuss our graph, right? We're going to look at its center. We're going to look at unusual features like outliers. We're going to look at its shape and we're going to look at its spread. From this information, we can find what we call our sampling distribution, and our sampling distribution is going to be the distribution of the values taken by the statistic in all possible samples. Okay, so I can use this information here. So I can use this to help generate a sampling distribution. It's going to be an estimate, okay, but it's going to be the distribution of the values taken by the statistic in all the possible samples of the same size from the same population. This is my ideal pattern. And this is usually too hard to do, right? I can't take a sam every single possible sample of 60,000 US households. That would mean millions and millions of samples. Okay, so it's usually too hard to do this. So you're gonna have to usually do a simulation so that you can imitate this and you can make an approximate sampling distribution. Okay, so let's run through kind of an example of what this would look like. Okay, so what we have here is they've used the Fathom software to simulate choosing 500 SRSs, remember simple random samples, of size n equals 20. So my sample size here is 20, a population of 200 chips. So basically I pulled 20 chips out of these 200 500 times. So I did, instead of having to do that physically, I used software to simulate that. Okay, and those 200 chips consisted of 100 red ones and 100 blue ones. Um, I've got a dot plot of the values of the proportion of P, where P is my sample proportion of red chips from these 500 samples. So here's my dot plot over here. Okay? And so I've got P down on the bottom, which again is my proportion of red chips. Okay? And you can see the shape here of my distribution here. So let's look at what it's asking. So A says there's one dot on the graph at 0.15. Explain what this value represents. Okay, so I'm looking at this dot right here, and it wants to know what that value represents. 
Well, what that means is that in one of the SRSs, so in one of the simple random samples here, there were three red chips. Basically, my p hat equals 0.15, which means that three out of the 20 were red. Okay, so that's all that means. So for part B then, it says describe the distribution. Are there any obvious outliers? Okay, well, let's look at what we've got going on here. So what we have going on here as we look at this okay, is that I'm roughly symmetric here. I'm also roughly bell-shaped. Okay, um, unimodal, one peak, right? So unimodal, roughly symmetric, bell-shaped, okay? And I've got my center, which would be around 0.5, right? My center is roughly here, around 0.5. My spread, I've got most of my values from 0.25 to 0.75, so the majority of my values fall right in this area right there. Okay, we already discussed the shape. Okay, and outliers, I have this possible outlier of the p hat of 0.15. Part C wants to know if it would be surprising to get a sample with a proportion of 0.85 or higher in an SRS of size 20 when p equals 0.5 and justify my answer. Well, if I look at my graph here, okay, I don't have any over here at 0.85. So it is very unlikely that I'm going to get an SRS of 20 chips in which p hat is equal to 0.85 um, with a pop from a population with p equaling 0.5 because it's never occurred in 500 simulated samples. Okay, and then finally part D here says suppose your teacher prepares a bag with 200 chips, claims that half of them are red. So this supposed same setup, a classmate takes an SRS of 20 chips and 17 of them are red. What would you conclude about your teacher's claim? Well, what I would conclude about that is that would put me way up here in this 0.85 range. And so I would conclude that she probably lied to me and that that's probably not, P is probably not equal to 0.5 because that's a very unlikely sample to pull. Okay, so let's use this figure to kind of hammer home the idea or the concept of a sampling distribution. So what we have here basically is kind of the progression along. So the first one here is my population distribution. So this is my population distribution. So in my bag of chips here, you'll notice I add up to 200 chips because I was told that there was 100 blue and 100 red and that they were a half and half situation, that 0.5 that P was equal to 0.5, meaning that 100 out of 200 of them were red, which means the other 100 had to be blue. So that's my population distribution. So then my next step is to take my distributions of my sample data. So for instance, this one right here, this is a graph of an SRS of um, 20, a sample size of 20. Okay, um, in this one, my p hat is 0.55. Okay, so you'll notice here it looks like I got 11 out of 20 of them. Uh, this one up here, this would be another SRS because remember I'm taking bunches and bunches of simple random samples from the same population. Okay, sample size of 20. In this case, my p hat is 0.4. 8 out of 20 of them were red. So I take bunches and bunches and bunches of these SRSs and then I make my approximate because remember, I didn't take every possible sample that I, every possible combination of 20, every possible sample that I could have taken. I can now make my approximate sampling distribution. So I could have run this through software, but basically what I did is I got p hat from a whole bunch of different samples. And now I make a dot plot here of my p hats. That's my sampling distribution. Okay, is this graph here of my p hats. And so we have to be sure that we know kind of exactly what we're talking about, whether we're talking about the distribution of the whole population, whether we're talking about the distributions of the individual samples, or we're talking about the sampling distribution, which is I take all my p hats and I graph all of my p hats. Okay, so let's spend the last few minutes here describing sampling distributions. So again, the graph of all of our values of our statistic from all of our different samples. So let's look first at if we're discussing the center. Okay, and so when we're discussing the center, we have to decide whether something is what we consider an unbiased estimator 
versus a biased estimator. So if it's an unbiased estimator, okay, then the statistic that's using to estimate our parameter is unbiased if the mean of its sampling distribution, so of that dot plot that we saw before, if the mean of that was equal to the value of the parameter being tested. So for example, in the last image that we saw, if the mean of that dot plot was the same as the mean of the first bar graph of the parameter then, then that we would say that was an unbiased estimator. Okay? Sometimes it'll have be a little bit more, a little bit less, but again, if we took many, 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 many samples, right, it would be um, the same. Some examples of things that would be unbiased estimators. Uh, mean is usually an unbiased an, um, estimator. Sample variance is an unbiased estimator. Okay? And p hat are usually unbiased estimators. A biased estimator then would have that my mean, the center value, my mean of my sampling distribution is very different from the parameter. Um, an example of that would be range is usually a biased estimator. So the mean or the center value of the range of the sampling distribution is not usually the same as the range of the, um, as the center value or the mean of the range of the parameter. Okay, so now let's look at spread. So when we're looking at spread here, okay, we're looking at trying to reduce the variability. Okay? And essentially, one of the ways that we can do this is if we increase our um, size of our random sample, okay? so increase the size of the SRS, not necessarily more of them, but take a bit larger sample, increase our sample size, maybe that would be a better way to word that. Okay? So if we can increase the size of the sample, that will usually decrease our variability. And that's a good thing. We want to reduce the amount of spread throughout the statistic. The variability of the statistic is um, described by our spread of the sampling distribution. So again, we're focused on the sampling distribution, so all the different values of the statistic of the different samples. The spread is determined mostly by the size of my random sample. So if I had 500 chips, you know, I'd want a 50 chip sample if I could get it. A larger, like I said, a larger sample will give us a smaller spread. Here's the, the kind of the catch though. Okay, and we have to keep the population size 10 times larger than the sample. So for example, in my example that we had before with 200 chips, we had a sample size of 20 chips. I could not take a bigger sample size because then I'm um, taking more than my sample is now, um, my population is not 10 times larger than my sample. Okay, so the spread of my sampling distribution won't depend very much on the size of the population as long as we're keeping that population 10 times bigger than the sample. So if we're trying to, if we're given a set of statistics and we're trying to estimate an unknown parameter, the one with the least amount of bias and the minimum variability would be our best one to choose.